What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Yard Podcast. I'm your host, Randy. And I'm your host, Cody. And today we're going to get into everything we've been seeing over summer camp as well as what we can expect to see from some guys, who has finally showed up to summer camp, who we're missing, just all the latest Dodger news and everything going around the league. But if you can do us a favor and give us a follow on all of our social media at Dodger Yard on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, as well as Dodger Yard 2019 on Facebook. And then you can find my personal at Randy underscore Radcliffe on Twitter and Instagram. And my personal Instagram and Twitter is Michael Cronin. And we are seven days away from opening day. We were supposed to record yesterday. We had some technical difficulties. So now we are actually seven days away. I can't wait. Um, So let's get into that. The Giants announced that Cueto would be their opening day starter this year. So we will see Kershaw, Kershaw and Cueto on the mound next Thursday at Dodger Stadium to open up the season. Um, things are getting going. The Dodgers have, I think it's one, two more inter-squad games tonight, Friday, and then they have a workout on Sunday and then their ex- or Saturday and their exhibition games begin on Sunday. So with that said, let's jump into kind of the player news and everything that's going on with them. We had heard that Muncie had been hit in the finger during batting practice live BP uh, due to the new batter's eye and center v- center field from all the renovations they've been doing. He said he hadn't been used to it yet, and it still took kind of a little bit of his eye to get the new look in, depending on pitcher's um, release points. So he said if there was a season happening today, he would already be playing. It wouldn't be a big deal. But because it is preseason, he's not going to rush it says he believes he'll be ready for opening day. Um, And he did take BP for the first time Tuesday since getting hit in the finger. He hasn't been taking any ground balls at practice yet. And in his first inter-squad game back, he had singled and doubled in his first two at-bats. So things seem to be going well for him. Um, Other than that, there aren't really any injuries dealing with on the team, which is great. We don't want that heading into the season already difficult enough with everything going on. However, with the batter's eye, Roberts had made comments and had said uh, it was a little unsettling to hear from players that they were having a hard time seeing it. Obviously, last thing you want is for players to be getting hurt, especially your own guys, because they can't see. Uh, Bellinger made a comment saying that players have already voiced their opinions to the team and that the Dodgers were already working on making adjustments. So I'm glad they're getting that taken care of. Um, I don't know what the issue is with some players and what it's not for others because there's some guys out there that are just absolutely crushing the ball hasn't stopped them and then there's some guys we've seen who are uh, verbalizing that they're having a hard time seeing so either way I'm just hoping they get that cleared up quickly get it taken care of Uh, but it should be an advantage to the Dodgers because if they're having a hard time seeing it I'd imagine any do you think it's because like some players have been there like a Cedar Turner etc Tico Taylor yeah, maybe, because I think we saw like guys like that have kind of have been in L.A. for the last month or two, and guys like Muncie had been home, and guys like Gavin Lux had been at home. Uh, they were not in L.A. as quickly, so maybe that's why guys like – maybe that's why Mookie struggled his first couple at bat. Not struggled, but maybe that's why he wasn't doing much his first couple at bats back at Dodger Stadium, because he made a comment that he hasn't done much baseball stuff, and now that he's had a couple inner squad games – Mookie's now looking like Mookie with the bat. So um, it does seem to be an adjustment period. I just hope we don't have anyone hurt anymore because of it, because that's not good. So hopefully by next week, they've got it all taken care of. It doesn't seem like any other players have had anything to say. So I'm taking that as good news. Um, More players have started showing up to camp. So we've almost got everybody there. Gonsolin showed up to camp for the first time last Wednesday. Friday, Lux showed up to camp. Alexander, Scott Alexander and Pedro Baez showed up to camp for the first time on Monday. Alexander actually threw a 15 to 20 pitch bullpen on Monday. So those guys are all getting back in. Pollock finally showed up to camp on Tuesday and he was taking BP. No reason was mentioned for why any of those players showed up late, which is fine. I don't really care. It's not any of our business. As long as they are healthy and their families are doing well, that's all I care about. Uh, Now that leaves only Kyber Ruiz is the only player on the 40-man roster who has not showed up to camp. However, I believe it was on Tuesday, Diego Cartea posted a 
video on his Instagram in batting cages somewhere. It did not look like Dodger Stadium, but he was in the batting cages and Kyber Ruiz was in that picture. So I'm assuming whatever's going on, uh, Kyber's doing all right because he's around other players. So I still don't think we've seen him at camp, but he's there practicing at least with some of the guys outside of camp. So good news there. And then our guy, Kenley Jansen, showed up to camp on Sunday uh, for the first time. And he actually had told reporters that him and his kids tested positive for COVID-19. Luckily, they're all healthy. They're all doing better. Um, he did mention how it was tough for him the first couple days and how it happened so fast. He said they took precautions, everything. They, like, didn't really go out unless I saw him posting pictures, like, at a baseball field practicing. But... It was just him and his family outside. It wasn't like he was around a bunch of people. So they even took their precautions. They still got it. But the good news is they're healthy. They've posted about it. His wife has posted about it, thanking the fans who all have had nice things to say. So that's all that matters to me. Um, with that said, let's get into the good stuff. We've seen lots of summer camp at bats, pitchers, everything going on this past week. So do you want to get us started with uh, starting pitchers updates? Yeah. So uh, Roberts has said that Kershaw, Shooting, and Woods will be built up to about 100 pitches uh, by opening day. And Wood last night pitched into, I believe, like the seventh inning. So I'm not sure what the pitch count was. It was like 80 because he was pretty efficient. Um. So getting into what I've seen in summer camp, I think Kershaw's looked really good this summer. Uh, my only concern is he's been really inefficient. Um, he's done really high pitch counts through his 46 innings. Uh, he has gotten swings and misses on his slider. His curveball looks kind of like in prime form. Uh, I'm not sure where his fastball is, but in spring training, I believe it was around 92. So hopefully it's around there. Um, the, the only issue with the slider is that it's, almost exclusively right now a ball. So if hitters can lay off of it, he's going to be walking a lot of batters. Um, Kershaw has dabbled with a changeup so far this uh, summer camp, and uh, Roberts has said that he's getting more comfortable with it. So that's a good sign. You know, uh, I do remember at least one instance of a changeup where he threw to Kike, and Kike kind of just looked like, where the hell did that come from? So I thought that was pretty funny. He got a grin out of uh, Kershaw as well. Um, so, moving on to uh, Ross Strickland, who has looked the best so far as far as speakers go. Um, no surprise, he's done his current change up quite a bit. Gotten tons of swings and misses there. Uh, he has made a few mistakes. He's left some fastballs up in the zone. And, of course, they were crushed by, like, uh, Peterson and Rios, I believe. Um, in his last in squad game, there was two sequences that really stood out to me, and he was just toying with Lux and Smith. So in Lux's at bat, it was just like a steady dose of changeups, and Lux was guessing fastball, and Ross pulled the string yet again, and Lux was way out of the changeup, just had no shot at it. And then in Smith's at bat, it was again a steady dose of changeups and curveballs, and Smith was um, thinking, okay, I'm going to get another changeup here. But Ross threw a fastball in the inside corner, painted it beautifully. And so Ross has looked really good. As I mentioned, he was supposed to be built up to 100 pitches by opening day. So in my mind, that means he's taking David Price's spot in the rotation, which is fine because he's pretty much more than earned it. Now, uh, a player that I wanted to be in the rotation is Dustin May. He's only had one start. It had mixed results, but for the most part, I thought he looked really good. He displayed some really nice sliders and change-ups. There was one particular where he threw the baby, where he just completely ate him up. He got close, he was swinging and missing on, on a change-up low. So that's going to be really important for me is his secondary pitches. We know he throws a nasty cutter and sinker, so if he can develop his secondary pitches like the slider, the change, and the curve, if he runs into trouble, he'll be able to get out of it, and this should make him go the extra innings. Because last year we saw he struggled around, what, the fourth or fifth inning because he really only had two pitches. So if he continues to develop these secondary pitches, it's only going to make him go deeper into games, pushing the seventh and eighth inning. Um, in that start that May had, he went up against Josiah Gray, 
Um, now, I'm a big guy here because I'm a big inside great fan. But to me, great looked better. I thought he faced the tougher hitters, like the stars like Betts and Peterson, Turner. Um, so he did give up a lead off on one of the bets, but I don't necessarily think that the bat pitch is kind of out of half and a bit low. Mookie just really put like, a good swing on it. Uh, what Gray did do really well was jam players with his fastball. He throws about 95. I guess it has like some late life to it. He's able to get it in off players' hands, so they just kind of just swing and miss at it. And when they do hit it, it's just like a jam shot. Uh, there were some jam shot uh, base hits, but for the most part, uh, he did really well with his fastball. His breaking ball was it was okay. Still needs uh, improvement. So that's uh, one thing, especially the changeup. Um, Players were out in front of the changeup, but it was always in weak hits, so he needs to develop it a bit more so he can get those swings and misses because uh, the more times players put the uh, ball in play, the more times they're likely to at least get on base at some point. Um, as far as Ox Wood goes, before last night, he was decent, made some mistakes, uh, had struggled with his command. And then last night, the first really, two innings, he was a bit struggling. And then after that, he was just on push control. He was very efficient. Excuse me. He got um, out with his curveball and changeup. He had eight strikeouts in, a, I believe, like six and two-thirds innings or something along those lines. So, uh, Alex looked really good last night. And that's the way he's going to have to be if he wants to stick in the rotation. Because I think you mentioned that uh, Robert said players weren't going to have like a long leash as usual. Um, so Julio, Julio has looked really good uh, to some camp so far. Um, now, during his live batting practice I watched, he was a little bit spotty with his command. But during his two uh, summer camp games, I thought he looked really good. He started his fastball well. Uh, his changeup is something that I've really noticed. He's gotten a lot of things and misses on it. It's not quite as good as Strickland's change has been, but nonetheless, it's been really good. Uh, his curveball has looked pretty good as well. Um, I'm, so he threw his curveball almost exclusively last night more than the changeup. So I'm guessing that was something either he or the team had wanted to work on, and uh, it was really good. He only went four innings, though, so hopefully... And it, was, it, was, it was very impressive for innings, but hopefully... Uh, he can build up to at least five and six by the time the season rolls around. During the uh, broadcast last night, um, the Sportsnet LA people, I don't remember who the lead guy is, so sorry to you. He said that they're not sure that Walker Dean was going to start the second game, so the guys are trying to figure out who's going to pitch second, whether it be Wood, Stripling, or Urias. Um, so I thought that was something worth noting. Yeah, that's um, not great to hear, but... No, it's it's not good I, to hear because mm. kind of need the guy. Uh, that's supposed to be our guy. I know uh, last week on Sunday he threw to hitters and it was only one inning and he was supposed to be facing hitters next. And I know Robert said he believes Bueller chose to take some, some time off and that was kind of his decision. And now he's behind on all other pitchers. But last he said was that he still expected Walker to throw three to four innings in his first start and said it had nothing to do with an injury. So I'm really hoping that this is just a case of Bueller kind of uh, was not prepared versus there's something going on because in a shortened season, uh, this is not really what we need right now is to be finding out that what some guy, what some fans would be considered our best pitcher to not be ready to go come opening day just because he decided to take some time off. That's just my opinion. Right. I just don't think this is a very good look uh, when you have all the other guys out there working their ass off, throwing 100 pitches by opening day, and now we don't even know if Bueller's going to be able to go. But hopefully it has nothing to do with an injury. Hopefully it has nothing to do with his home life. If it does, I totally understand. But let's just hope that he gets back on track and everything's good to go. Right, and I know we kind of went back and forth on this the, the other day, but like I, I agree with you now. If he's not going to pitch, then it it becomes an issue. Yeah. Um, I get him wanting to take time off to be with his fiance. Congratulations to him, by the way. But yeah, this is 
really not a good look. And if he's not picking second, I hope it's Strickland just to break up the all lefty thing because that annoys me. Yeah. That's me to hear on that. Um, so if he pitches maybe the fourth or fifth game, uh, we'll, that would be what, Houston? Or no, it would be Giants, right? It would be the Giants. It would be did. Giants if it was um, four, yeah. Yeah. So if he can go two, three innings maybe and then Sweat may do the rest, I think that would be fine too. They can just do that to be able to do back up, but um, yeah, not not the best of starts here. Um, so moving on to uh, relief pitchers, you had brought up that Kimmy showed up, and in his first outing, he got four outs. He did it very quickly. Um, Breezar also had a, a quick outing, and then yesterday he was uh, a bit shaky. A lot of pitches over the middle, like I said during the spring practice. Um, that is kind of the one thing I did notice about his fastball is I, mean, I know he's so far, but also it's, I guess the best way to describe it is it just seems heavy. Like some people so hard, you just throw your bat out there, the ball will travel because of the, the force and the whole thing. But his fastball, it just seems really heavy, and that when players hit it, even when they hit it like kind of on the barrel, it doesn't really go anywhere. Because I, I thought like two or three batters had barreled up his fastball, but it. There were singles, but they weren't like anything spectacular. They kind of just landed in front of Mookie or uh, Bellinger. So that's something to look out for. But hopefully he can um, locate his fastball better and throw more sliders. Um, He seemed to be fine with how he pitched yesterday. Uh, Roberts was cheering him on. So maybe this is just like a, I don't know, one time thing, or they were impressed with his. Delivery, which is very important. And if that's the case, then fine. The results just weren't great. But again, if it, the approach was fine and he did everything he was supposed to do, then that's good because he'll figure it out at some point. I was gonna say, um, like with him, I'm I'm a big fan of him. Like I just I'm excited to see him because of how hard he throws and knowing that like we've got him six years, like he's a totally controllable player. But uh. I also don't think I realized, like, I feel like I knew this, but I don't think I've paid much attention. Like, he's only 21, which is insane. Uh, So I don't know how much time he got with the Twins. I know it wasn't even, it was probably, I think, like a month, if that. But um, hopefully it's just like a command thing, because when guys throw that hard, if he can find his command, he's going to, he's going to be a huge piece to that bullpen. Yeah, he's very young. And I, he got caught up in, I believe, September, and he didn't make the playoff roster, but I think he pitched good anyway. Uh, he didn't look good in his appearances, though. Like, if you go to, like, maybe, like, Pitching Ninja or something, if you go back to the timeline, you'll see him throw, like, a 100 mile an fastball and then a uh, sweeping slider that completely fools hit him. So he's definitely got the stuff to be a back end of the bullpen uh, player, maybe a future closer for the Dodgers. Um, speaking of future um, closers, uh, Blake Trinan, who was a closer of the A's, has made a few appearances. And his first appearance, uh, his fighter and changeup was really good. His fastball, however, was flat. It was catching too much of the plate. Thus, was getting hit. Uh, Rio hit a bomb that I thought was going out of the stadium. But in his second appearance, he got two strikeouts on breaking balls. The movement was there, and it was just way too much for the hitters. In his final appearance, I think he was throwing exclusively sinkers. He got uh, Smith and Lux to ground out and then struck Beatty out on a nasty change in the dirt. So the more times that Trident has showed up, or come out there to pitch, the better his stuff is looking, the more his ball is moving, and the better his command is getting. So if he can be half of what he was in 2018, then uh, this is going to put the Dodgers bullpen uh, top five. I'm excited. Yeah, because I know MLB had them ranked as top 10. And on yesterday's podcast, when we uh, initially talked about this, we had said that I think both of us agreed that they could easily be better than top 10. There's just a couple moving pieces right now that we aren't 100% sure how they're going to pan out. But like if Trinan's up to his potential, if you're going to talk about Joe Kelly, but what he's been working on, if that's going to or I guess you're not really going to talk about Joe Kelly because we haven't seen him at all during the games. I don't believe he didn't. He wasn't there last night, was he? 
Yeah. Okay. So I just know he's been working on his grips, and he told Alana he feels so much better than he did last season. Um, so if all those pieces kind of come together, and we spoke about Jansen and how I kind of feel like for him it was a mental game when it came to the Astros and how they kind of just mentally fucked him up. I mean, you can't blame him. You go from having – one of the best closing years almost in history in 2017. Like he was just what he was doing was stupid. And then you go and get rocked during the world series. I kind of feel like that did something to his mental a little bit. Um, yeah. Now that he knows they cheated, I'm thinking we'll see the same Jansen we got. And when he comes out there and his first appearance is eight pitches against Mookie Bellinger, Seeger and Turner, uh, things are looking pretty good for us. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, throwing in, like, Gosselin, who's been good out of the pen, also been good as a starter. Um, not sure about Alexander. Colorbeck has looked better in spring recently, which I should have probably mentioned. So, so sorry, Adam. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, the bullpen definitely has potential to be great. It also has potential to be terrible. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one of those things. Uh we're going to uh, move on to position players. And uh, Cody Belgian has changed his batting stance in the placement of his hands. So his feet in the bottom, I mean, his, his lead foot is turned in slightly. It's not as dramatic as Cody Seeker's, but it, it definitely turned in some. He's also changed the position of his hands. He did it again last night. Last night, it looked like he went back to kind of what it was last year, like kind of on his shoulder and he's wiping it back and forth instead of previous games where he's kind of had it at his chest and wiping the bat. So not sure what's going on there. I, one thing about Ballinger is I wish he would stick to something. Like I know if something's not working, he wants to do something else, but I feel like he has to get into a flow of something before just kind of throwing it away. So that's one thing that he really just needs to pick a batting stance because it, it changes way more than any player I've ever seen, to be completely honest. Um, so I'm a person who looks at the process of that bat more than the result. The results haven't been good for Bellinger either, except for that first game against Kershaw. Um, but he's been, he's been swinging at a lot of bad pitches. His play discipline hasn't been good. And he's pulled off on a lot of pitches. So like It seems like he's trying to pull everything instead of just going where the pitch is. Um, so there was one at bat where the pitch was outside, he stayed with it and drove a single into left field, which is nice to see, but he needs to do that consistent consistently. Like we know Bellinger as a player who can hit forty, fifty home runs. I I wish he would sacrifice some home runs sometimes and kind of I don't say turn into Seager, but at at some at certain points you have to kind of be Seager and just willing to go the opposite field and hit a double to the gap or single on the left field or a blooper into left and you can change, but turn that into a double because of your athleticism and speed. So I do wish he would, he would sacrifice um, his power a little bit more. Um, I mean, he was a player who, I mean, from high school, he had one home run senior year and now he's just exclusively a power hitter. So I, I kind of want him to find a happy medium between his high school contact days and his power days now. Like he was doing kind of last year. Um, and then it kind of just went away. So um, hopefully he can find that medium because he, he really needs it. Uh, speaking of Corey Seager, he looked really good at the plate. He, um, he had struggled the past few games. He struck out a lot. He's back to swing that first pitches, whereas earlier he was kind of just going with the count. So, um, but for the most part, I feel like he's been locked in. He's a player who's not too happy. He's happy to go with where the pitch is. If it's over the play a little bit, he'll hit it the middle. If it's inside, he'll pull it. If it's outside, he'll go with it and hit it to the left field. That's the opposite field. So, um, I think he's really dialed in. There has been some points where he's missing the breaking ball like really badly. Um, but I don't really worry about that with Seager because I feel like he's a, he's a really good hitter. He'll, he'll fix that with no issue. Another person who seems to be locked in at the plate is Justin Turner. Um, I mean, when you think of Justin Turner, people 
to say he's a professional hitter because he is. That's what he does. He doesn't have the most power, but he gets hits. He'll get on base. And the thing I like about Justin is he has this very fluid, smooth swing. It's really just a thing of beauty. And um, we're in, what, the middle of July, or late July, so this is an April, so maybe we'll, we will avoid those slow JT starts. Yeah, and I can't and, imagine someone like him took much time off, like, during uh, during this lockdown, especially with him being a free agent. Like, I just can't imagine that he sat at home and, like, was like, oh, well, just once I know what's going on, I'll come back. Like, I just – I have a feeling Turner's been on it this entire time. And so, like you mentioned, we might not even see that April kind of slump because he just kind of, I don't think, ever stopped uh, working. So it's going to be it's going to be a good year for him. I hope it is because he's worked his ass off uh, since he came to the Dodgers yeah. to put in that work. And even b- before he came to the Dodgers and this could be his last shot at a, a contract, depending on how many years it is. So I hope he has a solid year. Uh, how old is he? 35, 35, I think. Yeah. I can see the Donnie giving him. I could two, see two maybe years. Three. Yeah. Especially with the because DH coming into play. The DH coming, yeah. As much as yeah. we hate it, like, I say that and people are like, no, what are you saying? Like, F the DH. And I'm like, yo, F the DH. But, like, let's be realistic here. It's probably coming. So I'm just thinking ahead, like, what could actually work? Because I hate the DH. But that's not going to stop it from coming. So I'm going to already start putting that stuff into my head and start thinking about like that strategy, even though it's a year down the line, because it's bound, right. it's bound to happen, even though we hate it. In in yesterday's recording, I had said that uh, Corey Seager could hit 400 in the game season. I'm going to say Justin Turner is probably going to hit. If anybody comes close to the 400, it's probably Justin Turner. Just because I think he, well, we he's saw really him locked in. do that. What for? Like, uh, what year was that that he did that? When he made the, I think it was the year he made the All Star team, right? Where he hit close to four hundred for like two, three months, something like that, like three eighty or whatever it was. Yeah. So yeah, I think if there's, he's like you mentioned, he's a professional hitter. Um, he does obviously strike out, but it's he. The one thing that I appreciate about him is when he does strike out, it's not just one, two, three, sit down. Like he battles and he is up there and makes the pitchers. Uh, throw the ball which Works, I feel yeah. like some people don't realize how important that is like I there's times where I would rather my guy battle off nine to ten pitches versus having a hard hit ball and going oh well he made good contact he just hit it in the wrong spot like no I'd rather you foul off nine or ten pitches and strike out because cool you made good contact but you did nothing uh with a nine or ten pitch like that's getting a pitcher it's working pitchers it's it's much more important than I think uh we realize as fans what it is to have someone up there who can do that uh I would agree I do like the the long at that it shows that players are like you said battling and just really making the pitcher work and that's that should be your job making the pitcher work and then of course getting on base yep I agree um, so moving on to the next person, we're going to talk about uh, Jock Peterson. Um, uh, Jock has <laughs> looked like working with Jock to me. He has, definitely has his moments of power. And then, of course, he has his moments of swinging at terrible pitches. Um, the one thing I have been surprised about is he's still bases. I know it's only been two, but when he's been on base, he's stealing. So um, you had mentioned that Jock had slowed down. And that's why you're uh, high on him having a great season. Um, so it's it's nice to see that he's kind of got some speed back and he's going back to that prospect jock where he was a 30-30 guy in AAA. And so that, that's been definitely nice to see. Yeah. Have you been surprised by that? I I have been. I feel like we've seen him in the past where he'll go through phases like this where he'll look good and then he might put on some weight. Uh it was funny because I actually had someone DM me, I think it was last night, and they're like, I haven't completely opened it yet because it takes me a while to get to those. But uh, I saw the notification and it was like, <laughs> they were like, hey, it looks like Jock has put on some weight. And I'm just thinking to myself like, wait, I feel like he looks like he's dropped a good maybe 10, 20 pounds or at least slimmed it down into muscle instead of 
what Jock has always looked like, in yeah. my opinion, like baby fat. Um, yeah. And so that, for me, I think is a lot bigger than because – the thing is, is you can look at someone like him and you and I have talked about this and you can be like, oh, yeah, he looks good. But what is that going to translate to? And for me, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll translate to anything at the plate. Uh, I like that he's losing the weight because and he went and saw a movement coach that uh, Austin Barnes has recommended to him. And I like that because we're already seeing him move better in the outfield. He's made some nice kind of plays like over the shoulder, gone up for some balls a little bit. I've seen pictures of him during these inner squad games. And I think that's a lot more important than maybe some people, maybe some people do know. I don't know. But to me, I think that's fairly important because you look at what could happen during the season. If Jock is in shape and can play left field, uh, preferably over Pollock, obviously when there's a righty on the mound. And I would prefer if there's a righty on the mound, I would rather Jock be in left field versus Jock being the DH because my mind is if Jock is the DH, that leaves Taylor, Kike, or Pollock in left field, which is fine, not a big deal. However, I like the idea of Jock being in left field and having someone like Edwin Rios DH against righties versus having Pollock, Kike, or Taylor bat righty versus righty when we can see what someone like Edwin Rios is doing at the plate. Um, so I think that's where Jock losing that weight and slimming down is going to be huge for the team because him being in the field now opens up an even bigger at bat in comparison to Taylor, Kike, and Pollock with someone like Rios. Um, so I don't know. I I also just think a lot of guys, when it's their, especially someone like Jock, when it's your first chance for a big contract since your rookie, like it's his first chance since his rookie contract, uh, they tend to play, I think, a little bit more and a little bit harder, and they kind of go for it a little bit more in my opinion at least so I'm, I'm hoping to see an all-out year from him I don't think he's gonna all of a sudden be this like crazy guy who hits for average I still think we'll see like a guy who hits 260 270 but uh I just I think he's gonna have a little bit more value to the team than he has in years past I can I can buy into the him slimming down making him uh be a better player because but you need to swim down as well, and he's looked really good so far in camp. Um, also, so AJ Pollock looks like he swim down and worked on his flexibility. He seems a lot faster than what he did last year. Because he, last year he seems like he's like slow and plotting. I mean, it was just one game. I mean, he did him to two double plays, which is mid-season Pollock. But uh, in those double plays, he almost beat out the throw. So he, he's running really well. There was also a play in left field where uh, Bellinger hit it and it was just slicing down left field line. Paul ran a really long way to get there and made a nice catch. So it looks like him swimming down and working on um, his flexibility has helped him some. So Jock swimming down should help him as well. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned uh, Edwin Rios, and uh, I've told you this before, but he should 100% be the opening day DH especially against a right-hander in Johnny Cueto. Uh, he looked really good during sp- summer camp. He looked really good during spring training, too, but the power has really shown up. Uh, his approach is he's not worried about striking out because he's going to do that. Um, so he really has no fear of swinging. That's clear because he swings a lot. <laughs> uh, but so far, it's working out for him. I know you said you don't like to swing. I think the swing is amazing. I know I'm in the minority. I I know, like I know most people. Is it because people, he, he still got a little wag over his head? I just, no, it's not. It's the follow through. I just yeah, the follow through. Yeah, the I guess head. I'm not a big fan of the whole one handed all the way behind. Like I just I don't like it. Just for me, it's a very like show follow through, which is fine. Like I will never disrespect him for it. Like if it works for him, I could care less how he swings the bat in his follow through. It's just, I don't know, like for me, I think, I think with Edwin, his swing is very long and very smooth. And I think I am just more of a, I like the aggressive swings. Like I like Bellinger's jaw. Like I I just think it's the type of swing he has. It's a very smooth, long swing and there's nothing wrong with it. I just. So you like violent swing? Yeah, I think so. I like the aggressiveness behind it. Um, 
I, I don't know though. I like, I don't hate it. I'm just not a big fan of it. But again, I, I could care less what he does out there. If he keeps <laughs> hitting bombs the way he's hitting, he can do whatever he wants. Fair enough. But so the next player is, um, Gavin Lux. Now he had just gotten to camp. He's only had a handful of that bad, but did not look good against the wing, but this is his first at bat since I spring training. So really no big deal there. Uh, he swings his farm, but he definitely needs to work on his timing because his timing is off. He's had two or three hits. They've all been to left field. Um, he had one against uh, Uris yesterday on the fastball tie. He just tied outside and he didn't move it to left field. The other time, I believe he struck out on a curveball. Beautiful pitch by uh, Urias, which whoops. The curveball was what he was working on all yesterday. And then uh, Adam Kolarak. It was funny because yesterday that was like you had mentioned how Adam is one of those players yeah. where he struggles against righties but he's good against lefties and yesterday was a perfect case of that um, against Lux he threw three pitches I believe two fastballs and then like a change up and Lux had no chance um, and then a righty came up I believe it was Austin Barnes Barnes walked because Colorado couldn't find his own for whatever reason, after just throwing three straight strikes. And then Beatty came up, and it was the same thing as Lux. It just it was not a good at bat. So, Colorado has no issue getting out left hand. We saw it last year in the playoffs. He got out Juan Soto, who's a, a great hitter. Uh, he made Soto look stupid, and he made Lux and uh, Beatty look stupid yesterday. The writing is still an issue, so I'm not sure where he finds a spot on this team. I should probably put that in the Maliba section, <laughs> but anyway. Um, Talking about uh, catches and Austin Barnes and Luke Smith, um, I, I've been happier with Barnes at bats than Smith. Smith has had two home runs, and the results definitely favor Smith, but I like Barnes' approach to the plate more. Um, so while it won't lead to as many highs as Smith's um, plate approach does, there's, uh, there's I think there's more consistency in his approach than Smith. So, But while I do say that Smith should definitely still start, because Barnes is definitely better in that backup role. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. And Smith is still young, like 24. And uh, he should be given every chance to see if he can handle the, the daily duties. But on to everybody's favorite player, T.K. Hernandez. Um, T.K. has been T.K. has been really good defensively, which is not a shock. It's, he's good defensively at second, short, first, left, center, right, wherever you put him. What do you want defense? I'll give him that. Um, He's looked good against lefties. That's nothing new. He always kills lefties, especially Bum Garner. Um, against righty, a little bit of a different story. Um, so, I mean, Kike's been Kike. I think he'll definitely be the start at second base since Lux just got to camp and he's still working on his timing. But I'm not sure how long he'll hold on to that starting second base role. But I think he's better moving around. I think we discussed this before. It's better if he just moves between first, second, short. Uh, left center right. Uh, Max Muncy, who he, who he had mentioned earlier, got some at bats. He mentioned the first game he had a single and double. He started at bat. He actually hit uh, a fly ball from the one he tried in left field. He hit it pretty well. He barreled it up uh, pretty well. So his swing was good. His timing was good. And it was, he was really bad in spring training. Like his plate discipline was just, I don't know where it went, but so far in his. I would say six or seven at bats uh, during summer camp. His plate discipline has been there. Again, he's put really good swings on the ball. Um, the tower hasn't been there yet, but I think once he's fully healed, and, uh, I'm sure that finger's probably still sore. Um, so once he's fully healed, um, we're going to get back to seeing the maximum thing we've seen in the last uh, two years. Yep. I Yeah, I think so. I think uh, he he's one of those guys that, what we saw, I feel like uh, his first year with the team is something that I feel like we are not going to see very much with people. Uh, he came out out of nowhere, and I feel like it, it put very high standards on him. And then last year, he, he did really well last year. He was not bad by any means. I definitely see him being as like your consistent kind of guy who's just the same kind of hitter his entire career. And you're going to kind of always – get the same type of guy from him every year which I I like that I like knowing what we're gonna get with Muncie and I feel like that's 
just always going to kind of ring true to him. Um, he's, I don't know. I like him. I, I'm glad we've got him. I think he's going to have a pretty decent season. So it'll be exciting to see what happens. And uh, yesterday you had mentioned about a contract extension, and during the broadcast they brought up it was a three-year extension, so he'll be around for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I think it was. I think it might have been a one-year extension, but they bought out his arbitration or something like that. Yeah, they bought his arbitration. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Dope. Cool. Because yeah, he. Yeah, that was all I had for the uh, players. Cool. Well, I like it. I, I'm uh, excited to see them out there. We've got ourselves, like we said, a, another inter-squad game tonight and tomorrow. But with that, let's get into we are finding out that the Dodgers are adding more players to their player pool per MLB transactions. The Dodgers have invited Michael Bush, Anthony Garcia, who they've already sent back down to minor league camp, Landon Knack, Bobby Miller, Ryan Pepio, Dubre Ramos, and Carson Taylor were all invited as non-roster invitees. Um, Cody Hosey will also be joining the Dodgers player pool according to J.B. Hoonstra. Hosey did post a picture on his Instagram story. I think it was Tuesday night that he was in L.A. Uh, so that seems to be true. We haven't seen anything with the Dodgers yet in regard to him. I think it's because they have to go through testing, make sure he's good to go before they can actually put him out on the field. So I hope we kind of see them get some work. My guess is they'll be at USC. Last week we had also also mentioned Devin Mann. However, there seems to be a ton of confusion around him. Uh, I don't think anyone really knows if he's been invited or not because I think it was on Monday or Tuesday John Heyman tweeted out that, like, hey, Devin Mann will be with the Dodgers once he's cleared, yet not one Dodger t person reported that. So I don't know what's going on with him. Um, I don't know if you saw – uh, Bobby Miller <laughs> posted a picture <laughs> yesterday. Uh, that dude is going to be the perfect fit for LA. Like just what he was wearing, everything like it just screamed like the most, like he's totally chilling it over like one of the freeway overpass in LA with his, <laughs> his surgical mask on. And then just in like head to toe, just what, it, what you would see in LA. Like that dude is He's going to fit. I meant to send you the picture last night and I totally forgot, but I just started laughing and I'm like, all right, he's going to be good in LA. This is going to be, he's going to like it here. But uh, <laughs> I'm excited to see I was going to say, like, I know it's not going to happen, but having or being able to watch like an inner squad game between the, those minor league players that you would see would be fun to watch, especially for me. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of fans would like to see that. Um, I don't think it'll happen just because of the, yeah. capabilities but um I don't know it'd be cool to see them hey they're they're staggering the players coming in so I do think it'd be kind of cool if they were like hey Saturday uh our regular guys are gonna do their workout we'll let them decide like do you guys want the morning or do you want the afternoon they probably want the morning because they have their game on Sunday let them get in and then get all get your second group of 25 26 players however out there and have them have a game and have it be like Cartea uh Miller all these guys like that Bush Hosey right. and see and I think that'd be a lot of fun yeah. I just don't think it'll actually happen having Miller face like Hosey or Bush would, would be fun to watch yeah I just don't think we're gonna get that lucky but you never know we'll see um as for the player pool on Monday, Roberts had made some comments about potentially adding Terrence Gore to the player pool. Uh, I don't understand it. They mentioned adding him due to his speed and how he could be a huge asset for extra inning games with runners starting on second. And then he followed it up saying something could certainly happen in the next few days. I'm not a fan. I don't like the idea. Not in a shortened season. Uh, we got that extra roster spot. We've gone to 25 to now 26. However, with it being a shortened season, I just don't like the idea of bringing someone like Gore in who doesn't really have much of a bat. They're just using him for his speed. And I get it. Extra innings, having a guy start on second would be huge if you know he's like basically guaranteeing scoring from second on a ground ball to the outfield or whatever. But this is a short season and every single game is really going to matter when it comes down to it. And I just can't think of pulling someone like Turner out of the lineup to go, Hey, Gore, go run for him. And then it comes up 
backfiring and now all of a sudden we don't have Justin Turner in the game and someone else is playing third base or well to, to that point it's because they worked on it yesterday so like in the seventh inning they just put um, Anthony Garcia on second base so I don't think he's taking anyone's like he's not running for anyone he's just getting put on second base it's still not a good idea though because I mean Chris Taylor Gavin Lux and even DJ Peters can do that yeah. Just perfectly fine. Yeah, and I just I don't like giving up a bat for speed. I I think our lineup is so deep that if a guy starting on second and we have three outs and can't bring him home, like I've always been of the mindset that if that team is going to beat us in that situation, we don't deserve to win. If our guys are going to have a runner starting on second and they can't get him to score and we lose that game because they couldn't bring him home, in my opinion, like we didn't deserve to win that game. Like it's just that's how baseball is. If you can't bring him home, especially with our lineup, I'm just kind of like I'd rather just I don't want to say I'd rather take the loss because that would be stupid for me to say that. But I don't know. I just I I don't want to give up at bats uh, for speed when I feel like our team is good enough to get it done. I mean, I know people are anti bump, but literally teach them how to bunt and put a bunt down and you have a guy at third with one out and if you can't bring them home at that point I don't know what to tell you I get it it's gonna happen we're gonna see extra inning games where people don't get them home and I'm fine with that it's part of the game but if you go four or five innings and you can't bring the guy home then I kind of just chalk that up to it wasn't our night and it just the pieces weren't falling into place but yeah that's just me on to the next thing uh, it was announced that the Dodgers will have a few games on Fox and FS1 this year, and that is beginning July 25th with the Giants. That'll be on Fox, July 28th at Astros, FS1, August 14th at Angels, FS1, August 25th at Giants, FS1, and then September 12th versus the Astros on Fox. So save that. With that said, they also announced the 2021 schedule, which I could care less about besides the fact that I know when the Dodgers are going to Houston. Uh, not a fan of MLB announcing the 2021 schedule because it sounds like they did it to try to get people to keep their season tickets and not ask for a refund and be like, hey, I like these games. I know what they're going to play. Go ahead and keep my money you've taken for the season, and I'll just use them next year. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. MLB your fans need those money need that money a lot more than you do so to throw that out there to entice them to keep their money I just not a fan of the move but with that said the Dodgers are opening 2021 on April 1st at Colorado their home opener will be April 9th first the Nationals they will host the Astros August 3rd and 4th and then they will play in Houston May 25th, May 26th, and I'm going to tell you guys right now, I need everyone to wear a damn mask because if I, and I know a lot of Dodger fans are going to feel this way, if we lose our opportunity to go see the Dodgers play in Houston next year because this stupid virus is not gone because you guys don't want to wear a mask, I am personally going to be very annoyed because I have waited for this chance since the moment they announced the Astros have cheated. I've known since 2021 was going to be the year we play the AL West because we play them every three years. Last time we played them was 2018. Uh, and I'd like my chance to go to Houston. And I know there's a lot of other Dodger fans that would. So wear your masks so that I can see you guys all in Houston and we can go make our voices heard uh, to the Houston Astros because – we all hate them, and they're a bunch of fucking cheaters. And anyways, before I get more upset, let's move on. Jaime Harin was nominated for the Radio Hall of Fame. He's heading into his 62nd season out with the Dodgers, so huge congratulations to him. Uh, he shouldn't even be nominated. They just should have said, hey, you made it. He's incredible. He's been the Dodgers' Spanish voice for years now, so going to say congratulations to him because I don't think there's anyone who doubts that he will be uh winning that nomination and becoming a part of the hall of fame uh, another big thing dodgers foundation was selected as a play finalist in the my la 2050 grants challenge they're in the running to receive a hundred thousand dollar grant to make a dodger dreams field project in compton a reality they need our help for voting voting takes place from monday july 13th through july 20th so you have a week now you only have, I think, what are we, the 15th? So you have five days left, four days left. Uh, 
So get those votes in. It's been on Alana's Twitter, the Dodgers Twitter, Dodgers Foundation. Help them get those votes in. Help bring more baseball to the community of L.A. Um, They could really use it. We could all, I mean, the foundation could really use it. They could really use our votes. Help them get out there. They've done so many great things. So get your votes in for them. Moving on to MLB news very quickly. They had intake intake testing updates was the testing that they did that first day uh july 3rd 1st whenever they started having players come back it was the first initial testing through july 9th the tests came back on friday last friday and out of 3748 samples 1.8 percent of them came back positive 58 out of 66 positive test results were players with the eight other being staff members However, testing has now moved into the monitoring stage, which means they're having tier one individuals, which are mostly players, coaches being tested every other day. And I believe that's like the training staff. It's the people who are hands on with the players. And then they have tier two individuals getting tested multiple times a week. Uh, Quite frankly, I think they should also be every other day and it should be one day tier two is getting tested next day, tier one, so on and so on. Um, However, they're getting tested multiple times a week. With that said, those results came back and out of 7,400 tests, only 17 new positive tests came back, which is a 0.2% rate. rate, So that's huge. Uh, 13 out of 17 positive tests were players. Obviously, one positive test is too many. It's not worth the risk for any of these players to get it. So I don't want to pretend like 13 tests is great. Uh, However, I will say it's better than what I expected. Uh, so I'm a little bit happy that that number is lower than what it could be considering they ran 7,400 tests. Now, if you combine the testing number, it comes to 83 positive tests out of 11,149 samples with a positive rate of 0.7% from testing that began June 27th through this Friday, July 10th, uh, or through last Friday, July 10th. So They're getting the testing done. It sounds like they haven't had many issues with the testing now that they're about a week and a half in. So as long as they can not have any more issues, I think things will be okay on that end. I hope it will. Uh, This virus is very real, very scary, and I just don't want to see any of these guys get it and have anything serious happen to them or their family members. It's just not worth it. So let's just hope that MLB keeps it up and, uh, doesn't screw up the testing any more than they already had to begin with that said though I did want to point something out very quickly there was an athletic article that came out this uh, last couple days and there's a little bit of a tricky situation for the Dodgers and the Nationals based on the cities and counties they are in for LA and Washington DC if a player is tested positive and anyone else has been exposed to that player while uh, he tested positive The people who have been exposed now have to quarantine 14 days. Uh, It sounds like that could affect the team. So let's say someone gets tested positive and then all of a sudden 10 guys were exposed. They made it sound like all 10 of those guys would now have to quarantine for 14 days, which is huge. And I 100% get the uh, safety behind it. However, it's a major disadvantage for the Dodgers and Nats because the other teams do not have to deal with this. So... I don't know how that's going to work in baseball. Last week, uh, Chapman had tested positive in the Yankees. He was at the Yankees stadium like two days before he had tested positive, like a day or two. So I think if that was the Dodgers situation, anyone that uh, Chapman had come in contact with would now also have to quarantine for 14 days. And when you think about the rosters, uh, even 10 people, I know we've got a 60 player pool, but having 10 guys get exposed and having to miss 14 days could be huge. So I'm just praying our guys are being super safe because that could be a major disadvantage. And just because like we mentioned, the virus is serious. So we'll have to keep an eye out on that. Last thing for today is umpires have started opting out. As of now, there have been at least 11 umpires who've decided to opt out of the season It sounds like most of them are doing it because they have family members who are ill. So completely reasonable, even if they don't have family members, them opting out is completely reasonable because at the end of the day, these umpires are not very young. uh, So they are high risk. And then you've got guys like Joe West, who's 
young, not young, and not a dude who's in shape. So that man is definitely high risk, and he wants to come out here and say things like he doesn't think the virus would actually be a big deal and he's not worried about it, which pisses me off because it sounds like he's completely fine with putting our players at risk. So I'm not a fan of that. Luckily, the MLB union came out and kind of shot that down and said, no, we don't really we don't have the same beliefs as Joe West. Like we believe this is serious. Yesterday I saw that they are now talking about potentially having the umpires wear masks uh, while they are calling games, which shouldn't even be a question. Like these umpires aren't running bases. Like sure. They might have to jog behind a player, like up the first baseline a little bit, but wear the mask. First off, you're high risk. Don't put yourself at risk and don't put these players at risk. Uh, a lot of fans already aren't, big fans of umpires so I don't really think they want to give anybody a reason to say you know what we're over it just give us the electronic strike zone because if for some reason umpires don't take this seriously and it gets to a point where they don't have umpires they might have to figure something out like the electronic strike zone and that could end up pushing umpires out for good so wear the masks don't be like Joe West and other than that, that's all I had for this week. Do um, you have anything um, else to say? I wanted to say, yeah. Um, so during last night's broadcast, actually, um, they had said that it's going to be mandatory for the home plate umpires okay, to wear perfect. a mask, but the base line people don't. I'm not sure what sense that makes, but yeah, that's what they had said. Also, uh, we all know Joe West is done. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't the first time he's made that call, so this is kind of parkour for him yep. at this point. Yeah, everybody, everybody was kind of, everybody who saw that article, I think it was The Athletic that put it out, everyone was like, oh, this is the least shocking thing I've read today. Like, nobody was surprised that it was Joe West, but um, as for the, the linesmen, I, I kind of, the, line, the, the field umpires, I kind of get that a little bit because they could tell them, hey, you need to be at least six to ten feet away from the players, uh, it would be nice to see them wearing it. However, the umpire literally who puts their hand on the catcher's back a lot of times, like they're literally breathing yeah. into that same air. Uh, I'm glad that they're making it mandatory because that to me seemed ridiculous that it was. I mean, if you're going to be making base coaches and managers wear it, uh, the umpires can do the same thing because right. it's it's yeah. a health so thing. It's behind not... home plate's mandatory, and then the baselines are optional. Okay, I'm hoping the baseline umps will just decide to do it. Uh, like I said, it's not it's it's not harder to breathe, guys. It might be a tiny bit a little difficult to breathe if you've got one of those crazy N95 ones, but you can breathe, especially if you've got a surgical mask on. We see our uh first line people who are saving everyone's lives out here they do it for 12 to 15 hours a day so uh I expect everyone to do it I don't care I mean I'm not expecting the players to do it I get it but the umpires they can do it coaches managers I think everyone can do it so just wear your mask wash your hands yep. we all want baseball back next year please 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 just follow this even if you don't believe it just follow it because nothing bad's gonna happen if you don't believe it's real just put your mask on Tell yourself you're doing it because you care about the people around you, even if you don't, or even say it's because you want to go to a baseball game next year. I don't care what the reason is. Just please find a way to wear it. With that said, we hope you guys have a great rest of your day, night, morning, whenever you listen to this, and we will catch you guys next week for our final episode before opening day. Uh, yeah. So hope you guys have a good rest of your day, and we'll catch you guys next week. Bye, guys. See you later, guys.